Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. Welcome to Redeemer Church Colchester Online. Before we start our sun worship, I'd love to share with you a verse from Psalm 118. It's verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray together as we come to worship. Father, we thank you that you love us, that you're good. We rejoice in you today, this beautiful day that you've made. And we just ask that by the help and power of the Holy Spirit, you'll help us today to worship you, to praise you with all we've got. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Good morning, church. Um, this morning, I really wanted to encourage you to think of things um, that you are grateful for. Um, we were talking about this at Life Group, and um, I felt really stirred that um, I should remember more things that I'm grateful for, even in this time of uh, hardship and uh, missing friends. Um, and I just wanted to pray for us that we would be able to remember these things. Um, so, Father, thank you that uh, we have so many uh, wonderful things in our lives, despite all of the um, all of the things going on in the world at the moment. Um, Father, thank you for the, uh, the time I can spend with my wife. Thank you for um, uh, thank you for friends dancing outside the window. Um, thank you for all of the things you have blessed us with, even in this time of uh, trouble. Amen. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy path Thy hands have made 
him to die, I scarce can take it in. Let on the cross my burden gladly.
Oh uh-huh. 
come to the part of our service now where we love to give. This is part of our worship and it's primarily for those who call Redeem a home. If you would like to give, please follow the instructions on the screen. Thank you. If you'd like to find out what's going on at Redeemer during the week, please head over to our home hub. The address is redeemerchurchcolchester.org forward slash home hub. And there's a lot that you can be involved with. We have, time, we have devotional times, we have times of fellowship, prayer times and a games evening. And our life groups are still going via Zoom on Mondays, Wednesdays and Thursdays. We'd love you to hook up with us. Head to the home hub. The address is redeemerchurchcoaster.org forward slash life groups. Over the past eight months, it's been a real joy for us here at Redeemer to have Gio, Camille and Samuel Bush with us all the way from Tampa, Florida and the USA. At the end of the month, they're heading back home and we will miss them. Before they say a few words to the church, we as the life group leaders would just love to say a few things. We just want to say thank you for being part of our life group. You have brought such joy and laughter and fun to our group. You have also been an amazing example of how to live your Christian life with servant hearts. Thank you for that. We will really miss you. Thanks also for the times of worship you've led so beautifully, so sensitively to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your contributions within the group when we've looked at God's work together for the way you've included people. We will miss what you bring, but more than that, we'll miss you as people because you're absolutely fab. God bless you. God bless. Hi. This is Samuel. This is I am Camille. And this is Daddy. And I'm Gio. And we are the Bush family. And we are from Tampa, Florida. But for the last mm -hmm. eight months, we've been here visiting you guys in Colchester. We've called it our home. We came here because Gio was pursuing a master's degree at the university. So we have, I think, been going to the church since, like, October. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And upon coming to the church, we just looked online uh, for churches. And when we saw Redeemer, we just, uh, it, it looked like a friendly group of people. And so when we actually came inside, we were just so impressed by the warmth and the love and the feeling of family. Which was big, because we were very homesick. So right away we felt, you know, connected to people and we felt like we belonged. Yeah, and through our time here, we've been able to connect through a life group with Alan Debs. Uh, and just their family is amazing. And we just love them and their godly kids. And so being able to connect too with some of the families and the friends involved with that life group has meant so much to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, each week uh, we were able to uh, visit in their home and just spend time learning both with students and other young adults about what's going on in their lives and just seeing God break through in a lot of good, good ways. It's been very special for us as a family. Yeah. Um, we're going to be heading back to the States next week um, and we just wanted to say goodbye to everyone and let you guys know how much you mean to us. Yes. We've made some lifelong friendships and memories with people and we definitely will be back to visit everyone yeah we, we love you guys and um you guys are in our prayers especially with everything going down and the, the lockdown and this time um we're just so grateful for you guys continue to be present uh, both online and reaching out to us we encourage you guys if you're not part of a life group to find one to connect to to get plugged in and uh, we hope to be able to visit with you guys soon enough thank you guys we love you all say bye, bye. Hi everyone, it's Alice here. We're just going to spend a few minutes praying together. We're going to pray specifically for those who don't yet know Jesus and that people would come to know him. The way we're going to do it is by praying through three specific prayer points in 30 second bursts. The first prayer point is going to be that we pray that we would have a genuine desire on our heart to see others come to know Jesus so I'm just going to start us off in prayer and then you have 30 seconds to go for it and really pray. Father God, I thank you that you're good and I thank you that you're, you're so kind to us. I just pray that you would give us a desire and a passion, Lord God, to see your kingdom come and that um, others would be saved, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Our second prayer point is to pray that we would be courageous and bold. Pray that we would have courage and boldness as individuals and as a church to tell others about the good news of Christ. Well done. Our final point is going to be to pray for one specific person who we know who doesn't know Jesus yet. They could be a family member, a friend, a colleague, a housemate. Let's just pray and press in in these 30 seconds that they would come to know Jesus fully and that we would have opportunity to speak to them about God. Well done, everyone. I'm just going to close in prayer now. Thank you, Father God, for your kindness and your love. I just pray that you'd continue to give us opportunity in this time to speak to others about your goodness. I pray that we would show them kindness and love in this time, Father, and that people would come to know you, God. Amen. Well, just a big hello to everybody at Redeemer Colchester. Um, I wanted just to send you this little welcome. The preach I've done online is a pre-record, one I made earlier, as I used to say in some television programs. Um, but I just wanted to say a big hi to you. I hope you're all doing well in this uh, coronavirus season. It's lovely to be able to be with you virtually, although it would be even nicer to be there in person. But I'm thrilled just to be able to have the chance to just share a few things with you and the passage that Hugh asked me to speak from was actually one I, I had prepared but um, had never used. So it's part one of a, or it's part two of a two part series on leadership that I was doing and I'd done part one somewhere and never got around to doing part two. So I've put the two together now so I'm going to try and do part one as well and make those available online. So um, you've helped me and I trust that what I've done will help you. So it's a lovely privilege to be able to just share the word of God with you this morning and trust that you'll be really blessed and uh, keep going.
All right, tremendous to see what's happening in Colchester. It really is many nations being touched through such an international community as you're building. So all, uh, all God's blessing and strength to you. All right, bye. Uh, we want to look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 20. And this is called the strengthening power of apostolic conduct. Uh, so I'll just read it through and I'll explain what I mean by that. So Paul's writing and he's saying, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, that our labour and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God, you are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it really is, for, sorry, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. Uh, the title, The Strengthening Power of Apostolic Conduct, is uh, in these two parts. I've, I've also done something about the strengthening power of an apostolic mindset. <coughs> so the way we think really matters as leaders. And I'm particularly addressing um, those who uh, are leaders or who feel a call to some sort of leadership, because I want to reflect um, in this session how God wants us as leaders to think. Because Paul's using himself as an example. He's giving the example of himself. He says, like, you know I live like this, we live like this, we've done this. So he's not just telling them what to do, he's, say, he's pointing to his own life as an example, which is the best way of leading anyone, just to be able to say, look, don't just do what I tell you, watch what I've done, so that you can copy me. Paul said to others, whatever you've seen in me or heard from me, put it into practice. You know, what the things I've done, you do also follow me as I am following Christ. So that's really important to Paul, that integrity in words and deeds flows. So this is about conduct. This session is about conduct, the way that we live. In verse 10, it talks about us being, you are witnesses, and God also is a witness, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. So he said, you watched it, God watched it, we all saw how we behaved. Our conduct towards you was holy and blameless. So in other words, it matters as leaders or as would-be leaders, those of you who are aspiring to leadership or those of you who are in leadership, how we live 
holy and blameless so that God can see it, others can see it, and they take note of it, really matters. Our conduct is the defining um, currency that gives us the internal authority with which to lead. We don't lead by having titles or external authority. We can have business cards printed saying apostle or whatever, or leader or elder or prophet or evangelist. We can have a card printed, you know, and buy a couple of hundred of them and give them out to people. That's external authority. It doesn't give you the internal authority. It is your conduct and the way that God affirms you and other people affirm you that opens the door for your grace gift to have its full effect. So let's just look at some of the conduct that Paul actually commends to them. He says in verse 4, uh, we speak not to please man, but to please God. So these are, uh, uh, these are men who've been approved and entrusted. He says, just as we've been approved and entrusted, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. We must never uh, water down the gospel, compromise the gospel, or fail to preach with integrity what the Bible says. Even if that means sometimes we have to preach beyond our experience, we can say, I personally haven't experienced this, but this is what the Bible says. This is the truth. To be able to preach with, um, uh, to to be able to give the entrustment, we've been given an entrustment that we have to pass on in its entirety. We've been approved by God. He has entrusted us. So therefore we have to be like ambassadors of another nation where we go and represent that nation. We represent the king. We represent what the king would have said. So we need to not try and please men, but God. Now, sometimes that can get us into difficulty. We don't go out to pick a fight. We don't go out to be deliberately provocative. I I think there are ways we can be winsome with people. We can use the gospel, uh, uh, use the the different ways of communicating so that the gospel isn't, isn't confrontative unnecessarily, but that we win with careful, tender, uh, um, delicate and uh, non-threatening uh, ways of presenting ourselves and the message that we bring. So it's important we think about that. How, what does it feel like to be spoken to by us? What does it feel like when we engage with people who don't know the Lord or when we engage with each other and teach each other and try to help each other? How do, how do we come across? It's really important that we don't water things down or be overbearing. Um, there's a lot of bits in the Bible at the moment that we might, oh, I don't know if I can preach on that bit. Uh, we've, got to be, we've got to be confident that at the right time in the right setting, we use the whole counsel of God and not shy away from things, even that society and culture would really, really have a problem with. If it's in the Bible and we're preaching it, we can say, this is not my opinion, this is what the Bible says. I often will refer back to that. I'll say, if people say, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? I'll say, what I think doesn't really matter. I can tell you what I think the Bible says, and you can look it up for yourselves, and look, here's what the Bible says. You must decide if the Bible is true or not. So that's the first thing. Second, in verse 5, it says, Never did we come with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. So flattery, first of all. Flattery is saying what you think you need to say in order to win the person through appealing to their felt needs. And it's not, it comes without integrity. Now, again, it's different to being winsome. It's different to being shrewd. Jesus actually commended shrewdness in order to try and, uh, sometimes get people on side with something we have to you know help them feel they played a part in it that that's not flattery flattery is when we're saying something just to butter someone up or using that phrase just to make someone feel good because we think if we make them feel good even if what i've said isn't true it just makes them feel good about themselves so they'll listen to what i've got to say even though what i'm saying isn't really true we don't do that to people we don't flatter people we don't win favour we don't win followership because we just keep saying nice things to people or treating people in an extra special way that makes them feel we're honouring them but actually then when they're on when we've got what we want we just drop them and then walk away we don't do that in verse 5 it says nor with a pretext for greed and what I mean by this is celebrity culture in Christianity is unhelpful where you know 
people do the, the, the circuit, the conference circuit, the preaching circuit, and it's all about how much money do I get, what are the royalties, what's the deal. That's, that's not good. That's not good. Paul even says, look, we could have made apostolic demands on you because we have a right to being supported, but we didn't even do that. We, we wanted to be like mothers gently with you and not put a burden on you. That's the way to be. We don't want to burden people. We want to serve people and trust God for the resources. We're not greedy trying to think, well, I'll take that booking if I get more money or I'll take that booking because I might get some money. Don't ever go near that. Don't ever go near that. We do what God asks us to do and trust him that he will provide for us, which he always promises to do. It's not for personal gain. And uh, verse 3 um, talks about our appeal doesn't spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. We're not trying to gain followers for ourselves. We're not trying to uh, preach with false motives. Now, I have to say at this point, do any of us ever really 100% know our motives? Do we ever 100% fully have pure motives? I suspect not. But where we are aware of our motives being challenged or questioned, it's important we deal with integrity and we actually have accountability around us. We have, uh, we help, have people around us to help us know when we take up offers of ministry here, there and everywhere. Now that may be for some of you not something you're encountering at the moment, but it might be in the days to come. So it's important to know. Verse 6, nor did we seek glory from people. Now, approval and affirmation are legitimate felt needs that we all want to feel affirmed and approved. We all want that. But ultimately, our approval and our affirmation comes from God. It's lovely to be encouraged by people and say, oh, that was great, you really served us well. But actually, if we do something so that our ego keeps being massaged, because we, we talk to the people that we know are always going to say nice things, and we avoid the people who, who perhaps won't, who, who, who would also, as well as being encouraging, might want to bring some critique as well. Avoid the people who are always critiquing you, never encouraging you, because they've got a bigger problem. But there's got to be this sense of we're not trying to just talk to the people who will make us, make us just say what we want to hear. We don't want to seek glory from people so people build us up and up and put us on sort of pedestal that's just not real. Nor do we want people to keep pulling us down all the time. That, that's, that's just as bad. We want affirmation and approval and to be loved as dearly loved brothers and sisters by those around us who care for us so much they want to encourage us at every opportunity but love us so much that if we say something or do something that they think, oh, I don't think that's really helping you, They'll actually say, I wonder if you ought to think about this. There's a way of saying things. Verse 7, we were gentle among you. Look at this, what a beautiful thing. We were gentle among you. If any of you have ever been in a situation where you've felt spiritual abuse being in a church, where people use the Bible to get you to do things, they manipulate you through scripture, through guilt, it's awful. It should never be the case. We're gentle. One of the hallmarks of genuine apostolic grace is a gentleness the DNA is gentleness with God's people. For example, when Paul was in Corinth, he didn't, he didn't hit them with a stick and say, this is a mess. He did say your meetings do more harm than good. But he did say before he got anywhere near there, he said, I love you and you're, the, you're my seal of my apostleship. I thank God for you. He was, he was gentle, even when he had to bring some significant correction. Be gentle. Sometimes we as People are not so far on in God as we think we are, and we need gentleness. And even I, I've always believed this that even if someone's got character challenges, but there's a gifting there, you, you protect the gift, you protect the gift, and you do everything you can to make sure that the character gets into line with the gift. You don't dismiss someone who's got a gifting just because they've got some work to be done on their character, unless they, unless they obviously disqualify themselves through doing something that completely renders them unable to carry on in ministry for a season uh, or forever, um, if there is such a thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, we protect the gift we, and we're gentle, with, we're gentle with people. As it said there, as a nursing mother, that's the image that Paul said, a nursing mother. What, what mother nursing is harsh and, 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 and abusive to their child? None. They, they nurture, they care for, they want to bring out the best. That's the attitude leaders should have. 
And then verse 8, we share with you our very selves, our very selves. We don't just want to share the gospel, we want to share our very selves because you've become very dear to us. This is why we called Relational Mission, Relational Mission, because we wanted it to be brothers and sisters who are friends on a mission together. If you just have the mission and no relationship, it gets very driven. If you just have the relationship and no mission, it becomes very sentimental and probably a bit inward looking. But he shared, we, he says we shared the gospel, so there's mission, and we shared ourselves. Now that's not a mission, that's a, that's a friendship, that's a, that's a relationship. So there's mission and relationship in that, and that's really important, which means we're vulnerable, we're authentic, we take relational risks. I've found through being a Christian for nearly 40 years now, at times I've been very hurt by people. People have let me down. Sometimes probably I've done the same thing to other people. I've always tried to put that right if I've been aware of that. But sometimes people say and do things that really hurt you and you think, I don't know if I can really trust anyone again. I don't know if I want to put myself through that again. Listen, we have to live like that. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was let down. But yeah, he still stuck with his disciples. Peter denied him, but Jesus still stuck with him. We've got to forgive and forgive and forgive, just as God in Christ forgave us. We don't have the right to say, I'm withdrawing my affection. We don't have the right to do that. So it's about um, uh, being also a model to copy, a lifestyle that speaks through the rest of the week, not just on a Sunday morning when we open the Bible. Uh, And it's one of the challenges we face as an apostolic family of churches because as we get more spread out and uh, there's more churches and more nations, how do you keep that sense of relationship and proximity and sharing of yourself when there's many miles apart? It's a big challenge. That's why Paul said, I've longed to come to be with you, but Satan hindered me. Uh, He says that, doesn't he, in... um, uh, in in, uh, in the end part of that. He said, we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. It mattered to him that he couldn't be with them to share his life. He didn't just want to send them letters. He wanted to be with them. It's an impossible task. I find it difficult because I can't be with all the people I want to be with, but I can do the best I can do with things like this. Uh, and I can send others who actually can do what hopefully I would do and maybe do it even better. That's how we have to multiply ourselves in the future. And in leadership, that's what you have to do. Set the standard, train others to watch what you do and then get them to be just what you would be when you can't be there. That's how movement is created and not static ceilings. Um, Verse 9, our labour and toil, our hard work amongst the churches, our labour and our toil... Church leadership is costly. It costs. It's not a nine to five. Uh, You never finished with it. And and I would always say to anyone who says, oh, they feel called to serve God, I would say, make sure that that God has said that to you. Test it out. Because if it's just an idea or, you know, that'd be nice to do that or a bit of a career option, you won't last five minutes. This will take everything you've got and more. It's, it's toil, it's hard work, there's concern for the churches, there's difficulties, there's disputes, there's advances, there's problems to solve, opportunities to grasp all at once, there's personal pressure because you've got to live what you're saying, you've got to have, you can't just, there's no such thing as an unimportant conversation, every person matters, every conversation matters, every decision matters, it's not like a, an office job where you can shut the door at the end and walk out into your other life, this is your life. And yes, we have to be good with rhythms and all that sort of stuff as to how we manage and our energy and time and refreshment and all that stuff and Sabbath thing and all the things that are good. And I particularly recommend the book The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Very good, particularly for millennials, just to read. Uh, I think that's a helpful book, not necessarily prescriptive on everything. I wouldn't necessarily say I'd agree with everything, but I think the, the basic principles are excellent in there. Uh, but it's toil and labour. And uh, then verse 11 and 12, it's fatherly, not functional. Uh, the exhortation is not to get a product, but to build the people. In 11 and 12, you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy. But this, this isn't someone casting a strategy. This is a father encouraging the family to become all that God has called them to be. We don't impose an agenda on people. We're trying to say, look... 
Walk in a manner worthy that God's, uh, uh, of God because he's going to make you flourish in the things he's called you to do. This is a fatherly exaltation. Eldership is a fatherly role. It's not a business CEO. It's not a, uh, an executive board. It's a, it's a team of fathers. And we need elders who are fathers in the church. We need m- women who are mothers in the church. We need brothers and sisters. It's a, f- it's a family affair. It's not a business. And so he talks father in a fatherly way to them. In verse 17, we long to see you face to face. Face to face. Uh, nothing replaces that. Goodness, at this, in, uh, as I'm recall, recording this, we're in the middle of the coronavirus lockdown and we can't see each other face to face. Goodness, it's the most antithesis of the church, isn't it? Where we should be together, uh, the body of Christ together, but we're, we're separated by this pandemic. Paul was often separated in prison. The church was sometimes separated through persecution. It doesn't mean that the church isn't the church. It just means that it's not the way we'd ideally like to do it. He longed to be with them face to face. But as he couldn't, he wrote to them. Uh, I'd love to be with everyone who's watching this, just so we could sit down, have a cup of coffee, talk about it. Or I can't, but I can send you this. So we do the best we can. It's being hindered. And he says, I, 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 I don't want to be torn away from you. And then lastly, verse 19 to 20, he says, you are our glory and joy. He prizes the church. He prizes it and he desires that she, that she may be safer, safer uh, after his life than, than she was before. And, and I think there's something about the heart of a leader that says, you know what? My ambition is that by the end of my life, the church would be in a safer, stronger, more blessed position through how I've served than she was before I uh, took up whatever ministry or grace gift God has given me. That's how leaders should think. We love the church. It's our glory, our joy. Jesus loves the church. We should love the local church. It's a magnificent, wonderful plan A. It's not a a parenthesis. It's not a, a, a secondary thought. It's not a passing institution. It's the thing Jesus died for. And every local church, properly, biblically constituted, with godly appointed out, God appointed leaders, with with the sacraments, baptism, uh, breaking of bread, with proper uh, preaching of the gospel, all the things that are hallmarks of the true church. For the church like that to be our glory and joy to flourish and mature and to become the full stature of what God wants her to be is every leader's ambition. Not building an empire for ourselves, but serving. And uh, I remember a story recently I read about... um, uh, you know, sometimes you see these uh, acrobats where they sort of a tower of people. And there's about, I don't know, four or five big blokes at the bottom. And then they fling people further and further up. And by the time you get to the right at the top, they're flinging young children. And they stand on the shoulders of the one right at the top. And everybody applauds the young child at the top who's flown all this great distance. And say, wow, look at that. What we have to remember is that the people at the bottom who are no longer being looked at are carrying the weight that gives the glory to the others who are being built together into a temple, as it were. Leadership is about being at the bottom, taking the strain, putting others on your shoulders, giving them the the elevation they need so that others can then be built on top and on top and on top, so that everybody applauds. Maybe not even you if you're a leader, but you know that your contribution has enabled someone else to fly and become all that they can be in God and bring about great glory. So I trust that's helpful and uh, that you'll be blessed as you just meditate on these things. Worth reading that through prayerfully um, from here and uh, asking God just to help us to be men and women of uh, real apostolic conduct, being like Paul in the way that we behave and, uh, and speak. Bless you.